Empire by Ch by Patrick Weeks, Chapter Seven. Back in the trees, well out of sight, Gaspard grinned as his archers opened fire. Beside him, Duke Remick stood calmly by his horse, resplendent in full plate armor of gleaming, gleaming silverite that had been enameled with his house's colors. I'm surprised that the Code of the Chevaliers allows you to use such tactics. We're trained to fight with honor, Remek. Not idiocy. The reign of Eris wa withered Selene's messy line. Soldiers exhausted from a long march and an ugly slaughter raised their shields a few heartbeats too late, and moments later, the cries of the dying surrounded across the field. The Code is meant to guide us to a path of glory, not restrict our tactics. You understand the difference? Not entirely, Grand Duke. Remek pulled himself into the saddle, ignoring a servant with his stool. But then, I did not train with the Chevaliers. Gaspard mounted as well. His armor gleamed like Remek's, but his enamel had been stripped bare, and the silverite shone pure. I will not assassinate Selene, he said, selling into the saddle. I will not poison her or have some peasant with a crossbow fire at her from afar. But you will mount an armed rebellion against her. The second wave of arrows clouded the sky. Selene's poor soldiers were still trying to pull themselves into a defensible formation. Gaspard paused and looked over. That's putting a bit of a point on it, considering you stand at my side, Remek. Again, Grand Duke, Remek said. I am merely curious about the code. You don't like the Chevalier as much, do you? Gaspard asked. When Remek made no reply, Gaspard sighed. When given direct challenge by a Chevalier, I will not answer. I will answer without hesitation. I will not retreat without order from my commanding officer, and I will not kill a lord or lady outside the heat of battle unless it is a legal execution in the name of the Empire and I will not wear my family's heldry while I fight Selene. I had wondered, Remick gestured at Gaspar's bare armor. To rise against the Empress while wearing my family colors would shame House Shalons, Gaspar said. If I fail here, I will not let the Empire think my house responsible for my actions. Only as Grand Duke, a member of the Imperial Blood, have I the right to challenge. Whatever other title I wear, I will win it on this, the field this day. If you fail here, I doubt Selene will take the state of your armor into account when deciding what to do with your relatives. Remax said with a smile. Gaspard chuckled. True. Fortunately, I had not planned to fail. He looked through the trees. Where the rest of his mounted forces were waiting, some chevaliers, some merely nobles like Remek, and some lightly armored men-at-arms, not nobles proper. Speaking of which, are they advancing? Yes, my lord, came a cry from a scout high up in the trees. Excellent. Coming out to protect their empress. Gaspard held out a hand and took the lance that was offered. They should have fallen back into the city. Remek shook his head and lowered his visor. Selene was riding near the front, Gaspard grinned. No chevalier would let his empress fall while he retreated to safety. Which leaves them out there for the taking. He stood in the stirrups. Sound the charge! The call went down the line. Gaspard lowered his visor, set himself in the saddle, and spurred his horse. It was the noise that always surprised him, his focus. The entirety of the world shrank to the enemy line ahead and the grassy field beneath, between them, with only the dimmest awareness of hundreds of his men spurring their mounts beside him. But the noise, the pounding hooves and clattering armor, thundered through the ground and up into his bones, even as his own panting breath echoed inside his helmet. He heard the crash of battle as he settled into his horse's rhythm, felt the stride, saw the distance to the enemy line, gauged the timing, and then launched himself perfectly into the moment of impact.
The shock of the blow blasted past his enemy's clumsily placed shield and punched through his breastplate. A killing strike, Gaspard noted with satisfaction. If the man wasn't crushed in the press of battle, he languished in a tent until blood frothed on his lips and a good surgeon put him down. The thought was by in a heartbeat. And then Gaspard was crashing through the enemy line, his lance gone and his blade out, lashing out with hard, short strikes that made the most of his mount speed and minimized the risk of having his blade torn from his hand. He took a blow on the shield and rode past it, caught another glancing strike off the pauldron, and then he was through. He pulled his mount up short and forced the beast into a turn once he was clear. Selene's forces hadn't been sure whether to retreat in full or try for a spear wall, and as a result, they'd made a weak effort at both. The men nearest Gaspard had punched through Selene's lines, and the men on the sides had pulled up short rather than diving through, per his orders. The middle was a mess, and the Empress was flanked on both sides. Gaspard looked over to see Remick cut down a footman with crisp efficiency. The man had good form. He might have made a chevalier, but, his, but for his romantic un misunderstanding of the tactics. Laughing aloud, Gaspard spurred his mount and rode back into the crash of slaughter. The massive warrior swung his great maul and the blow smashed past Selene's desperate defense and slammed her into slammed into her armor with crushing force. Selene saw the world spin as she fell from her horse, and then a second terrific impact drove away what little breath was left in her lungs. The world was sh all sharp colors, painful and glittering as the men around her fought and died. The morning sky was sickly with smoke. Sir Michel had been cut off from her, and over the din of battle he had gestured for her to retreat to the trees. She had almost made it. A few of her men around her while her main force tried desperately to recover, when Gaspard's warriors had found them. After that, everything was a chaotic blur of clanging metal and shrieks of pain. Gaspard's warriors stood over her, a huge man in huge armor. If he spoke, it was lost under the roar of battle. He did not salute with a great maul, did not extend a hand in the accepted tradition to demand her surrender. He turned and crushed the skull of one of her men, the only one who had still been standing, and then turned to her, hefting the maul without hesitation. It was in that moment that Selene realized she might actually die. She tried to scramble away from the warrior, but her breath wouldn't come and her side was a mass of crushing pr pressure. She had no idea where her ceremonial blade had fallen. She grasped blindly as the dirt as at the dirt as Gaspard's man raised his weapon for a final blow. Then, from the clattering roar of battle, Sir Michel rode into view. His charger smashed into Gaspard's man, and the huge warrior slammed into his, to the turf. Michel was on the ground a moment later, his pristine silverite longsword drawn and his shield up and ready. Gaspard's man rolled to his feet, graceful as a dancer even in his massive armor. And even as he came up, his maul was swinging up at Michel, but Michel stepped in close, checking the haft of the maul with his shield, and staggered Gaspard's, and staggered Gaspard's man with a helmet to the face. Celine rolled to her stomach with an effort. The pressure on her chest made every shallow breath a battle, and as she looked down, blinking darkness from the edge of her vision. She saw why. As strong as her armor was, the great maul had caved in the breastplate, bending it out of shape and stifling her like an iron corset. While Michelle fought for her life, Selene fumbled for the dagger tucked into a hidden channel at the base of her gauntlet. She worked it free, gasping, and sliced at the buckles that held her breastplate in, in place. She heard the screech of shearing metal and the clang of a mole striking home, but she forced herself not to turn and look as she kept slicing. Whether Sir Michel had already dispatched the villain or was 
bleeding on the ground. The armor still needed to come off, and so she focused desperately on the task at hand, sawing at drake leather. Her breath grew tighter, her head pounded, and wisps of light danced before her eyes. And then the buckle parted, and the breastplate fell open at an unnatural angle. She drew in a shouldering, shuddering sweet breath and worked frantically at the other buckles. In a moment, the great mass of now useless metal fell to the turf beside her. Celine would have given the dales a, for a minute to sit and catch her breath. But she was Empress of Celine, <laughs> but she was Empress of Relay. For m the moment, anyway. The title had not stopped Gaspar from attacking. It had not held the warrior back from caving in her armor with a great maul, but it served well enough to, ke to get her to her feet. As she rose, the ring on her right hand worked its magic, and the dagger flared with tongues of fire. Michelle and Gaspard's men had reached an impasse. Michelle's shield locked against the, ha the warrior's hammer. Each man heaving and moving with steps as quick and purposeful as the other. The shorter man. Michelle had better balance, but Gaspard's great warrior was simply so huge that Michelle was losing ground anyway. She walked as lightly as she could in her heavy greaves to where they stood, but without pause, she slid her flaming dagger up under the warrior's armpit from behind. Gaspard's man shrieked and jerked back. It was all the opening Michelle needed. With a rough shove, he drove the warrior back, and Celine dove out of the way, dagger raised to help again if she was needed. Michelle followed with a great overhand blow that the warrior weakly blocked, then locked the maul with his shield and chopped down, cutting deep into the warrior's leg. The warrior fell to one knee, the maul dropping to the grassy turf, and with a final strike, Michelle seared through the man's armored gorget and crushed his throat. Majesty, Michelle panted as Gaspard's ma man collapsed, still twitching. It is not safe here. Thank you, my champion. Celine coughed, still trying to catch her breath. I had wondered. She looked at the great warrior who twitched one last time and then w went still. Celine had killed before. Any woman trained by Lady Mantillon in the bardic arts could not only slit a would-be assassin's throat in the bedroom, she could then return to the party and make witty conversation with perfect makeup and clean hands two minutes later. Even during those tests, Lady Mantillon had praised her for her cold nerves. Still, it had been some time. My apologies, Michelle said. I have failed you. Hush, Michelle. While I still draw breath, you have not failed me. Celine looked back to the rest of the battlefield. Her men were being slaughtered, and there was no longer any line, just clusters of her troops around Gaspard's men, who were steadily butchering them. Riderless horses ran screaming through the field, and arrows still rained down on the remaining pockets of Celine's forces. Men wearing the imperial tabard ran for the forest, their shields flung down behind them. She had marched at a grueling pace and promised them an ugly but easy slaughter, and then a week of rest at her winter palace. The city, do you think? she asked. Michelle nodded. I see a little alternative. He whistled for her his house, mounted gracefully, and pulled her up into the saddle behind him. She opened her mouth to insist that she could still ride, and then saw her snowy white mare lying unmoving a few yards away. Its neck was twisted, and arrows were sunk into its flank. And for a moment, all Celine could remember was the last time she had gone riding. On the hunt in the woods, riding her mare, with Gaspard telling her whatever she, whatever happened was on her head. If she had known, she would have knifed him then and finished it. They rode hard. Michel swung his longsword into a steady arc, scything through foot soldiers, and diving back mounted enemies. For a moment, it seemed they were lost in the chaos of battle, no different from any other rider. But then, over the pounding of hooves, 
She heard the cries of recognition, and more arrows rained down on them. One glanced off her greaves, and Selene felt drip, sweat drip down her now unarmored back. A moment later, Michelle jerked his shield up, and an arrow shattered against it, a handbreadth from Selene's face. Thank you, my champion. The woods came out stuttering as she bounced on the horse's back behind him. I am a fool, Majesty. I should have had you ride in front. He chopped down through a spear as well as the spear man holding it. Then they were clear of the press of battle, riding hard for the city walls safe ahead. Behind them, she heard the crash of metal, and a quick glance showed a group of Gaspard's horsemen giving chase. Looking ahead over Michelle's shoulder, Celine saw the gates still open. Soldiers were pouring out, Compierre's men from Halam Sheral. Her heart swelled, and she looked over to their own and she looked to her own forces. With their numbers, perhaps she could still face down Gaspard. Even as she looked at the bloodied remains of her own forces, though, it struck her that she had burned down burned a quarter of Pierre's city to quell a rebellion he hadn't been able to put down, the rebellion that lured her into Gaspard's trap. Are they with us? She called into Michelle's ear. We shall know in a moment, Majesty, he said without turning. Ahead of the city guards, Comte Pierre and his chevaliers rode toward them. Pierre's armor was stained with soot from the ashes that had spread across the city and his face was drawn with fatigue and shiny with sweat. He had not the time to put his helmet back on after the morning display. Your radiance, he yelled as they approached. The battle had not ranged close to Halam Sharal Sh proper, and Pierre and his men had not yet engaged either side. This was when the trap would spring if he were part of it. His weapon was drawn as was only right. He was riding hard for them. She felt Michelle tense in front of her, ready to strike. Get to safety! Pierre shouted, and rode past them. The city! Or flee east to Jader if you must! We will hold them as long as we can! Celine turned and saw Gaspard's forces thundering towards them from behind, and from the right as well. She saw less than a score of her own soldiers still alive and no resistance to stop Gaspard's men from flanking her and penning her in. Compierre of Halam Sherwal and his score of chevaliers charged past them at the enemy line closing in behind them. She saw the rain of arrows come Give me a moment, sorry. She saw the rain of arrows come down into Pierre's men. They were far enough away for Gaspard's archers to fire without fear of hitting friendly troops. Pierre took an arrow in the shoulder but kept riding, putting himself and his men be beneath between her and Gaspard. And still, there were not enough of them to check the whole line. As if hearing her thoughts, Michelle called back, some of Gaspard's men will get by. She had not noticed him looking back, and she wondered if he could tell just by the sound of hoof beats. Can you make the city? Perhaps. There was a question at the end of the sentence, words he was unwilling to say even while carrying the emp his empress out of battle. Michelle, if we reach Halam Sheral, can we hold it? The city guards were stretched were stretched thin already by the rebellion, and I guess Pierre rode with most of his chevaliers, Michelle said. An arrow clanged off his armored shoulder. Ahead of them, Pierre's foot soldiers died under a withering black rain. Most of them will die, as will our own soldiers. With just the common city troops, it may give you a chance to negotiate a surrender, but it will not save the throne. Celine swallowed, and Pierre and his men would die for nothing. Her men would die 
would not die for nothing. The Winter Palace is not built for defense, Majesty. She had feared as much, but had wanted to hear it from her champion to be sure. It would have to be Jader then, several days' ride to the east, where Lady Cyril, a longtime ally of absolute loyalty, would shelter them. Get us to the trees, Michelle, she said. We retreat to Jader, contact Val Royo, and return to crush Gaspard with the full might of the Empire. As you say, as you command, Majesty, he said, and his charger pulled to the left, away from the city gates and Gaspard's closing men. They rode, and behind them, the soldiers of Olay died so that Selene might escape. Riella came back to herself in the dubious comfort of a prison coach, her head throbbing. It was far more gentle a prison than a common barred wagon, where she would have ridden on bare wood, open to the elements and the thrown rocks of human peasants. The coach had a seat, and it was even padded, if thinly. The barred side windows were curtained, though the morning light shone through the thin red fabric. Though the door lacked a handle, a small chamber pot sat in a holder by the wall. If not for the shackles, Briella could almost have fancied herself still traveling to Lam Cheral, Celine's favorite servant, secretly preventing a great and needless tragedy. Then the stench of the burning buildings reached her. The smoke stung at her throat, raw from when she had screamed the night before. Her armor was scuffed where she had fallen to her knees, wrenching free of the chevalier's grip. Michelle had struck her. She remembered dimly. It hadn't been punitive. She could see the wary concern etched into his fe features, lit by the fire. The other chevaliers might have taken her shrieks, her pulling away, as resistance, and done what any chevalier would do to a knifeier who didn't know her place. Michelle's gentle strike had been an act of mercy. She tried to remember whether his expression had given away any greater feeling about that fire, then gave up when sitting upright made her head pound with pain. The coach was moving, traveling the main road out of Halam Sharal if the gentle bumps and jolts were any gauge. Either Gaspard's gambit had happened so swiftly and smoothly that it was already finished, or it had not yet started. That Gaspard had a plan, she did not doubt. Celine had removed herself from Val Royale, thinking herself clever in outmaneuvering her cousin. It would never strike her that here in Halam Sharal, with only enough soldiers to crush some elven rebels, she would be vulnerable. Briella would have warned her. She, pu she supposed she still could. Her arms had been shackled behind her, and they ate already from the uncomfortable position. Being unconscious in her armor had not helped, either. She lay down on the seat, lifted her legs, and kicked on the sliding panel that separated her from the driver. After a moment, the panel slid back, and a gray-bearded man wearing a soldier's helmet and a chain mail vest squinted in at her. What do you want, rabbit? Briella swallowed. Some water, please. He frowned, evidently thinking over this outlandish request. Would it normally give a prisoner any food until dawn? Until noon? She stared at him without saying anything, and after a moment, he grunted and held a water skim up to the panel. With her arm shackled behind her, she couldn't take it. Instead, she raised her face up as close to the panel as she could and opened her mouth. The man unstoppered the skin and let her drink until she pulled back. He made no lewd comments, and she didn't even see a smirk. Thank you, she said when she was finished. Orders are to treat you gently. Just don't make any trouble, he said, not unkindly. And we'll have a nice, quiet ride back to Val Royo. He slid the panel shut. She looked at the wooden panel while tepid water dripped from her chin. She could be wrong. 
Gaspar could legitimately be so surprised by Selene marching Halam Sharal that she had no that he had no ambush prepared. He could still want to win the day through diplomacy and politics, limiting the spilled blood to the elves of the Halam Sharal. He might lack the nerve to commit treason by attacking Selene directly. But Brielle knew a great deal about Gaspard, and she knew never describe him as lacking nerve. The threat was real. The question was whether to raise the alarm. It would show her loyalty, and even in the face of what happened here. But what good was that, precisely? Her loyalty had never been in doubt before, and all it had earned her was an order not to mistreat the prisoner on the ride back to Val Royo. She had loved Celine. She did love Celine. And she knew without question that the elves of Orlais fared better under her rule than they would under Gaspard's. But she could still smell the smoke of the slums burning. She was still sitting silent, ready to knock on the wooden panel but not yet moving, when the cry of alarm rose around her some time later. Moments after it came Moments after that came the buzzing wind of hundreds of arrows, followed by the shrieks of men and horses dying. Calls to protect the Empress were drowned out by thundering hooves, and then the crash of metal rocked the coach. The noise was deafening, a cacophony of clanging and crunching, marked by grunts and screams as men died all around her. Briella shut her eyes, though it did little to help. She heard arrows thud on the wood of her prison, and then a sharp crack directly in front of her. She opened her eyes and saw that an arrow had ripped through the curtain and sunk a finger's width deep into the seat a few inches from her leg. Briella kept her eyes open after that. A sharp jolt rocked her coach, and a horse screamed from the impact. Briella heard her guard yell, and the coach lurched into motion. Briella lay, on, lay back down on the seat, bracing her, soldier, her shoulders and legs against opposite walls of the coach, and held on as the jolts and bumps rattled her like a stone in a cup. Then came the pounding of hooves right beside the coach, and a yell from the driver's seat that cut off as metal crunched on metal. A moment later, the coach shuddered to a stop with a suddenness that sent Briella tumbling from the seat. She lay on the floor, her head still pounding, as the sounds of battle continued around her. Men yelled, and screamed, and died, and horses thundered past, and Briella's coach rattled from the noise. Briella had no idea how long it lasted. It was impossible to think the coach shaking around her, arrows slamming into the walls, and men crying for the Maker's mercy outside. She huddled as best she could, teeth chattering, until finally, some unknown time later, she realized that the roar of battle had started to quiet. When the coach stopped shaking, she forced herself to back to her knees. There was no formal end, but when she heard the sound of men giving orders glo grow closer to the battle cries, she moved back to her seat. The calls around her had the same world-weary constancy of the Chatelain preparing for a minor, minor ball back in Val Royale. Get our wounded over here. Don't waste time on the buckles. Cut the damn thing off him before he bleeds to death. Send men with ropes to get the loose horses. One of the lords needs a surgeon for his leg. Don't kill the poor bastard. He might be one of ours under all that mess. And the wagon? Selene's elf, my lord. Briella opened her eyes. Grand Duke Espard opened the door to her wagon a moment later. He was unmasked, and he had taken off his helmet. But she knew his face from private encounters years ago, back when he and Selene had been on better terms. His hair was sweat-slicked, and his face flushed from the morning's flight, and his armor bore dents and scuffs, that proved that he had not hung back to let others fight the battle for him. You removed the emblem of Shalons, she said, nodding his bare armor. 
I knew you would have a means to justify it by the Chevalier's code. I remember you, he said, squinting thoughtfully into the dimness of the coach. Her handmaid. I was sure I'd seen you unmasked. No armor, then, of course. Of course. Brielle inclined her head politely. Gaspard smiled. And there's always a way to justify it, he said, in defense of honor or protection against corruption. He leaned on the coach, one gauntlet hand gripping the door frame. The other pointed at her, the silver eye glinted blue in the wan morning light. Against a mad empress in league with the elves. So you lied to your fellow nobles. Lied? Gaspard cut her off and shook his head, still smiling. There was more than enough truth than what I said. Don't be modest, girl. Noble Orlesian's sons and daughters came back from Selene's university talking about improving the alienages. And the professor's right that they're being asked to teach elves now as well. The taxes always seem to sly around the poor merchants. Maker's breath. How many times did I ask for leave to mount an expedition to drive out the Dalish only to get to set only to get sent off to hunt the Darkspawn instead. Three. Briella smiled thinly. I'm impressed, Gaspard said, with another shake of his head. One little elf. And you had the Elysian Empire dancing to your tune. So, no. I'd say the only lie I told was when I suggested you ruled our empress with arts practice in the bedchamber. Briella's breath caught. It was only for a moment, and she tried to cover it with a disgusted sneer. But get sparred, whatever his faults, was an observant man. Oh, Maker! It's true! Staggered, he staggered back as if shot, roaring with laughter. No wonder she refused to marry me! He actually pounded the side of the coach. Briella felt herself flushing and squared her shoulders as best she could with her arms still shackled behind her as Gaspard looked back in, wiping his eyes. I thought she was too proud, too idealistic, but I suppose my manhood was just the wrong tool for the job. I may as well have been hunting Darkspawn with cold iron. He grinned at her, when I should have been carrying Silverite. You're saying I'm Silverite? Brella asked, raising an eyebrow. You're easier on the eyes than I am, Rabbit. So you spread rumors which forced her to crush the rebellion instead of letting it spread her out and die peacefully. And because you knew she would come out here to make a personal show of force, you used it as a trap. Gaspard's easy grin faded. It doesn't sound like you're just now putting that together. At her silence, he nodded. Why didn't you warn him? Why didn't you warn them? Brielle blinked and looked at the wooden panel through which she had spoken to the wagon driver. I didn't figure it out till it was too late. Really? Gaspard asked, frowning. That's quite a shame. A little warning might have saved a lot of Chevalier's lives. I did my best to save lives, Brielle pointed with a jerk of her chin back towards Helam Sheral. It seems I have failed. The interesting thing, Gaspard said, looking at her thoughtfully, is that you had just told me that you knew I'd set that up, so Celine would have to come in and crush those rebels. But rather than blame me for setting the trap, you blame her for walking into it. I had never hoped for better from you, my lord. But you did from her. Gaspard shook his head. All these years, gently pushing her on your people's behalf, and you started to forget how much was her, and how much was you. You never thought she'd do something like this. But she's the Empress of Relay. She doesn't care about the elves. She'd kill every elf in the Empire if she has to. Brielle glared at him. You're lying she said, and her voice cracked. Apparently. I lie even less than I think I do, Gaspard said with a grin and showed his teeth. He stepped back and shut the door. 
then leaned in and spoke through the bared window. Now, you sit tight. You'll be heading back to Val Royale, and if you tell the right stories, you'll be comfortable and unharmed. If you help me with any information that crushes the last of whatever resistance Selene or her allies might come up with. And that's why you're here, Briella said, and felt a moment's satisfaction watching the big nobleman pause. It was the crack in her voice that had done it, the little bit of affected weakness that let him slip up. I'd wonder why you come to look in on a knife-eared servant so soon after your great victory. Gaspard chuckled. I thought I'd see the knife-eared servant who was so important to Selene. Whom you don't have yet, Brayla finished. Selene or her allies, you said. You wanted to see if she talked to me. If I knew where she was now. Because despite your ambush, you didn't capture her. Your swift, sure strike to take the Empire doesn't work without a surrender or a corpse. And you have neither. It hung between them. You're dangerous, Gaspard said, lips pursed in thought. He stepped back from the window, and his next words were to his men nearby. Keep a guard on the coach. Nobody talks to the prisoner. Brilla heard a clank and rasp of armor as he strode away, and then moments later, the soldiers got back to work setting up camp and tending to the wounded. They had never captured Falassin, as far as she knew. Selene was free. She had options. The options nearly paralyzed her, in fact. Selene in battle, possibly dead, was an idea. A series of actions that closed off certain avenues and opened up others. Selene was free, still in command of the Empire, was the woman who had burned the elven rebels. The woman Briella failed to learn, to warn. It would have been much easier had Selene died on that field. Briella would have mourned and felt guilty for mourning the woman who had killed so many of Briella's people. But whatever happened afterwards, it would have been simple. But simple would wait. Hopefully, Falassin would do the same wherever he was. Closing her eyes, Briella yanked the arrow, blocked from Gaspard's view when she sat up, free from the seat behind her and began working on the shackles. Gaspard had ordered his tents erected within sight of Alam Shiral's walls. He stood, uncomfortable in his armor, while a servant carefully cleaned the signs of battle from his breastplate, polishing away scratches and plastering over dents with a bit of paste that could be painted to match the shining blue-white of the metal. It was dull work, better done when Gaspard wasn't wearing the armor, but Gaspard suspected he might yet need it, and for what was to come, he needed to look noble, not battle-damaged. So for now, he comprised, he compromised, and stood stock still in his tent while the fussy servant made the breastplate that had saved Gaspard's life look pretty again. When it was finally done, he dismissed the man and strode into the prison camp tent, his armor gleaming in the midday light. By now, the smoke from Halam Shiral's slums was a dull haze across the sky, and dozens of smaller oily clouds rose from where funeral pyres marked in the scene of the morning's battle. The common prisoners were huddled together under heavy guard, stripped of their arms and armor, and the camp healers were doing their best to save as many of Gaspard's men as they could. The Battle of Halam Sharal, Gaspard said as he lifted the flap and let himself into the prison tent. What do you think, my lords? I must admit, Comte Pierre of Halam Sharal rasped from where he lay on a bedroll, a surgeon kneeling beside him. That I m might wish a different name. The man had been stripped of his armor, and his shoulder and gut were covered with blood-soaked bandages. The shoulder would heal. The gut wouldn't. Seated at the temp at the table, sipping a cup of watered wine, Duke Remick smiled. Completely understandable, Pierre. I would hardly wish it to be Lydes. Nor would the Grand Duke enjoy a battle at Verchiel. Unlike Espard, Remick had removed his armor. 
Gaspard supposed he should be grateful that the man at least put on riding leathers instead of court silks. Gaspard made a gesture, and the surgeon bowed and left without a word. When they were alone, Gaspard sighed. You will be proud, Pierre. Outnumbered, forced into the fight, and you still made it harder than I expected. She escaped. Pierre took in a long, ragged breath and stifled a cough, flinching as he did. So she did, Gaspard said, and knelt down by the injured man. Her elf, the one that killed Mainsarai? She has no idea where Celine might be. Mainsarai. Pierre's pale face twisted. Damn the man. He brought this to my city. The rebellion, the bloodshed, the fire. He smiled bitterly. I should thank the elf for putting that bastard down. Gaspard shook his head. No, my friend. I'm afraid you have no one but yourself to blame. Pierre's eyes widened, and he fought his way to a seated position. You insult me, he said, gasping the words through the pain. I will have satisfaction. Gaspard ducked his head. My apology, Pierre. I intended no offense, and my words were ill-chosen. With an effort, Pierre lay down. But the elves rebelled because you didn't crush them. You felt sorry for them, didn't you? Main Sarai deserved it, Pierre said again. Gaspard sighed. You thought they were right to be angry at Main Sarai, so instead of raising an army and stomping out the rebels, you wrung your hands and sent a few extra patrols and hoped everything would eventually quiet down. You taught the elves to fight, just like a bad horseman teaches his charger to buck and bite. He shook his head. You taught them to attack the guards while you allowed it to go unpunished. You taught them to dream of a life outside the slums where they belonged. And if Celine hadn't slapped the shackles on her lover and burned those slums, you would have taught every damn knife here in Olay to stand against us. Do you know how much damage was done to my city? Pierre said, his voice rough. How much coin I will lose? How many families will starve because Celine would not let the elven anger run its course? Gaspard smiled. Even so, now, my lord. Do you know where Celine would have run to? Pierre clenched his jaw. No, Gaspard, I do not. And you know that I would not tell you if I did. Behind them, Remek rose to his feet. I know a few men who might loosen his tongue. Gaspard froze, then slowly looked back over his shoulder. Compierre of Halam Sheral is a lord of Orlais, Remek. More than that, he is my prisoner. My code prohibits his torture. Remek nodded. Yes, of course. Perhaps you might wish to examine the defenses, my lord? If you take a few hours to ensure that the preparations are to your liking, I might have more news. Remek, have done. Gaspard stood and turned to face the lord to face the lord, his armor clanking with the movements. I understand that you don't think much of the Chevalier's code, but I will not violate the spirit of it to obey the letter. I will not torture him. I will not leave so that you may do. If you lay a hand on my prisoner, I will defend him with my life. Or, as it is more likely, with yours. Remek swallowed. Of course, my lord. I apologize. Accepted. Now, gather the men and the command tent. I want plans for the fastest and safest way to, blur to burn Halam Sharal to the ground. I... Yes, my lord. Remek bowed and left without another word. Gaspard, Pierre said from behind him. Celine could be inside, Pierre. Gaspard didn't turn around. My men say she rode for the woods, but they could have been mistaken. Or you could have shown her a hidden entrance. Maker knows Val Royale is full of hidden tunnels. Why should Halam Sheral be any different? She isn't inside, Gaspard. I have nowhere else to look, my friend. Gaspard looked back at the man on the bedroll, 
Pierre's color had gone waxy and gray. Rest now. I will send for the surgeon. I beg you, Pierre said softly. Do not burn my city. You let Celine burn part of it already, Gaspard said. Why shouldn't I finish what she started? Pierre closed his eyes and fell back. Anguish twisted across his features. Finally, he said, Jader, you're absolutely, you're certain of Lady Searle's loyalty to Selene? Gaspard asked. Absolutely. We have discussed it at length. Pierre didn't open his eyes. I told Selene to get to Jader if Palam Sheral fell. If she did not re reach the city, she rode east for Jader. Messengers would have been sent there as soon as you began your attack. Gaspard, Gaspard nodded thoughtfully. He hadn't been sure of Lady Cyril. The woman played the game well enough to have kept him guessing, but Pierre's anguish spoke of a true confession. He gave a sharp whistle. A moment later, a young woman came into the tent. She wore a fine robe of gray satin and a ring on each finger. Slung across her back was a slender staff. Heal him, Gaspard said. The gut wound first. Obviously, my lord. The woman said with a small smile, and Gaspard smiled despite his, himself. She knelt beside Pierre, and the lord opened his eyes in confusion as she touched him. A cool white light shone from her hands, spreading softly to Lord Pierre's wound. The circle has backed you? Pierre asked. The circle hasn't really voiced an opinion just yet, Gaspard said with a grin. This is Montsamard's daughter. Lien de Montsamard, my lord, she said with a small bow, not lifting her hands from the, well, from the wound. Montsamard saw the war between the Templars and the mages coming years ago, Gaspard said. He watched the healing magic with some interest. And when his little girl started hexing the servants and curing her horse's bad leg, he decided that he didn't want her in the middle of it. An apostate? Pierre looked down at, his, at the hands on his torso as though they were poisoned. Then he looked back up at Gaspard. Eyes narrowed. So I'm to be killed after all, then? You can't leave me alive after I've seen something that could have you executed by the Templars. Pierre, my friend. I allowed you to meet dear Lien for the, first, for the same reason that I healed you. Moving carefully around Lien, Gaspard knelt back down. You're mine, now. Pierre clenched his jaw. I gave you Jader to save my city, Gaspard. Yes, you did. And just like when you let those elves go after your guards, you taught something in that moment. Gaspard bared his teeth. You taught me where to hit you so you flinch. Now, if I had called for the surgeon instead of this long, lovely young lady, you had been dead inside of three days. And whoever took charge of Halam Sharal after you? If I threatened him with the death of his city, he might sneer and tell me to burn the filthy peasants alive. As Pierre went pale, Gaspard leaned in. But you love your city. You'll do anything to keep it safe. And you know that I know that about you. Then he sat back, then he sat back and patted Pierre on the leg with a little laugh. So I think it's best for you, and me, and even those filthy peasants, if Lien takes care of you. My lord, Pierre said so sadly, and shut his eyes, and nodded. Yes, I am, Gaspard said, and stood up. He left the prison tent and walked to the great pavilion where his men were speaking with Remick. Jader, he said as he walked in. Remick shot him a surprised look. Pierre gave up Celine's location? All in how you ask, Remick. Gaspard nodded to his men, who were already make marking spots uh, on the road to Jader. Cyril is Celine's, assuming we didn't get every damn bird that left the city. We did not, my lord, said Sir Billyu. Gaspard smiled. Ah, oh, well, one can always hope. Sarah will be ready. And given that her city is built to hold off half the dog lords of Seraldin if need be, 
That's going to be an ugly fight. Blockade, my lord? Asked Sir Lagia. Gaspard nodded. Across the Imperial Highway and through the trees. Here, he pointed at a likely choke point. I want to be able to walk from the waking sea to the frostbite. Frostbacks on their shoulders. Sir Bilyeu grinned. Might be hard to catch the Empress with you on our shoulders, Lord. Maybe Remick, then, Gaspard said, gesturing at the Lord. He's lighter. Same goes for the West as well. If she was smart enough to lie to our man Pierre, she could be running for Val Royale already. Remick smiled thinly. We block Selene from Lady Cyril to the east, and we hold Sh Halam Sheral as well as Lydes. She's trapped. Gaspard grimaced. She didn't rule this empire for twenty years just by throwing balls and banquets, he said, remembering what his cousin had said on that hunting ride a few weeks back. She's trapped when she stands before me in chains. And that is chapter seven of The Masked Empire by Patrick Weeks. <laughs>